we don't almost by design allow it to, especially given how siloed we are. And that's a problem if we think about moving to infrastructure that is completely automated. Uh, it's really not about defense in depth anymore, it's about defense in width. Like we just spray so much crap on a stack and hope that ultimately it is going to be protected that we don't know where, how, or why we invest in things. And ultimately the economic model for vendors is not incentivized to serve or solve long-term problems. It's there to sell product based on need. And most people aren't in the, in the, uh, uh, don't have the ability to actually look downrange. They're dealing with threats today. So if we look at this ultimately, and I dragged this from my last presentation, we, we, we moved from the mainframe model where stuff was very centralized, uh, ultimately uh, reasonably reliable but slow connectivity to client server, skipping minis to web 1.0 to web 2.0 with mashups to kind of this emergence of this dichotomy between mobile computing and cloud computing. And at the same point in time, the security community uh, as well as the industry has been remarkably consistent in its response to both programmatic development as well as how the architecture has changed. So almost consistently, we have done an excellent job of providing you one of these, which doesn't solve any of the actual long-term problems. And there's a reason for that, and that reason is called the uh, security uh, hamster sine wave of pain. Some of you may have seen it before, but I like to use this because it actually explains why we are where we are. We really do, uh, on the left axis, you basically have how we invest and where we deploy from a security perspective, and we kind of flip-flop between host-based and network-based centricity for our, for our solution sets almost constantly uh, over time. Right? So what happens is, you know, you can pick an arbitrary point in time on this sine wave. It's actually much more bursty, but it's smoothed and ribbed for your pleasure in this presentation. We start at host, right? We deploy an agent. Then we deploy 27 agents, one per threat. Then we converge those into a mega agent that takes up 86% of the CPU utilization and 14.7 gigs of memory. And we say, you know, this isn't working. So we say, what we need to do is focus on the application. We'll fix the apps. So we invest in SDLC. We basically retool the apps and everything breaks. We deploy WAFs and things break horrifically. And we don't know why, because the developers are completely disconnected from the security teams and the infrastructure teams. So we say, you know what? We'll focus on the information. We'll just protect it. Oh, where is it? It's everywhere. I don't know, you know, I have no ability to essentially get my arms around the information. So we'll move, we'll, we'll protect things by focusing on the user. We'll stop the monkeys from pushing the, the wrong buttons. And that doesn't work because people give up passwords for chocolate bars. So then we say, okay, speeds and feeds are awesome. We'll do it in the network, except we've encrypted all the data. So now I can't gain visibility without man in the middle, which breaks the applications and the users and the information. So it goes on and on and on. And to make it worse, if I overlay that sine wave with a cosine, which represents disruptive innovation or uh, new technology like cloud or virtualization, what you find is our deployment methodology is focused up here, where the actual use case for deployment of, where, of what you're actually able to deploy from a compensating control is down here. And what I mean by that is if you look at mass market public cloud providers where the network is abstracted, I don't have access to the network or its entire basis for what it looks like and where it is completely changes. So I can't deploy a compensating control the same way. So I have to deploy my guest. Right? So now I'm installing software instead of at four choke points at, at potentially hundreds of thousands of endpoints that automatically scale. So what's interesting is that differential, 180 degree out of phase, is hugely problematic. Right? But we flip-flop this way and we, the stuff in the middle, that information-centric cent part, is where we really auto-focus, but we never actually get time to do that. So when we look at this problem set and we look at the stacks on the left, I like to separate things into three chunks. And I, did, I, I bought this up uh, as a model in, in the Cloud of Fornication talk, and I'm going to do it again here. I like to break things down into three chunks. Infrastructure, which is kind of like compute, network storage, all the moving parts. Uh, infrastructure at the top, apps, data, metadata. And in the middle is metastructure, which is glue and guts, protocols. In a non-virtualized, non-cloud world, metastructure is supposed to bind or provide affinity between the infrastructure and the applications. It sticks them together. That's the old world model, monolithic apps. In virtualization or cloud, that middle layer, nearly uh, ultimately if you introduce virtualization in any concept or abstraction, is supposed to separate or provide basically a, a fluid layer between the two so that they don't, they are actually not statically bound, they're separated. The problem is all the infrastructure stuff that is used to interfacing with uh, protocols that are very stale and static completely break this model when we start to introduce mobility of workloads, of data, of information, right? So this notion of automation is really, really screwy, especially when you pair it with the fact that in public cloud providers, they're building this notion of idempotent infrastructure, where hardware, for example, and the software blends into this amorphous blob that abstracts capabilities, prevents you, uh, 
essentially presents you with certain layers and ways of interacting with the stack, but you don't know, what the, you don't know how they're composed. And so idempotent infrastructure is very interesting because it maps back to uh, the root part of how our practices have to change in the security world. So when everything looks the same, it's, it's both awesome and horrific at the same time. And we're going to talk about this. So idempotent basically is a computer science mathematic term that means essentially once I deploy, you know, I, I have one system, when I deploy multiple of them, uh, I essentially can affect um, uh, a, an issue of scale without change. So I'm essentially able to, I mean, that you can call it multiple times and it has the same result. So when you think about infrastructure here as it relates to cloud, it means I can spin up an image or a hundred of them, and essentially what I do is just serve uh, you know, more and better vo uh, greater amounts of volume. So idempotent infrastructure is interesting because when you think about it and cloud, uh, and the Matrix is a great example with Agent Smith, right? Just keep multiplying. All the skill sets are the same, but there's just more of it. Uh, uh, this notion is that homogeneity here provides the ability to scale out. Right? Which is something, if you have the illusion of infinite scale, is awesome because you can essentially, if you have that need, continue to uh, roll out more resources. It does not always imply commodity hardware, however. I told you that in the beginning, there's very much a difference between uh, one extreme on the, on the, co on the continuity scale of, uh, of what public cloud providers can, uh, can do and offer, and on the other end, you have people that differentiate and focus on a different set of, uh, of problems. So on one side, you could use commodity hardware. On the other, on the other side, you could use uh, best of breed. It does not always imply commodity hardware to get idempotent infrastructure. It really is there to maximize density. Uh, and modularity of resources, so I can quickly re reconfigure, be iteratively uh, extensible, so I can continue to add functions. It really relies on this notion of an agile software methodology and deployment, constant deployment of software, uh, such that it is really about being software enabled and driven, even if there's infrastructure and hardware underneath that empowers it. It's kind of this notion of code as infrastructure. And if you're a physical security, if you're, if you're a security guy that's normally used to deploying physical security, uh, things like firewalls, you know, where we basically just choke down on port 80, code as infrastructure should terrify you. At the same point, if you don't have those skill sets. Because ultimately, how are you going to uh, affect uh, the ability to audit, secure, um, and ultimately control infrastructure that can change at, uh, moment by moment? Um, that's not a bad thing either. And when we think about this, you know, we're kinda, we get scared about this notion of elasticity, where in many cases it's not the biggest problem that we have to solve. And when I talk about that, we talk about these stacks. What's interesting today is um, this notion of what is powering these clouds is, is rapidly evolving. We've got market leaders right now that, uh, thanks, that uh, have really uh, set the stage for the evolution of a lot of what um, a lot of what we, uh, we perceive as public cloud, but you also have a ton of movement now. Um, you've got all of these providers, there's probably 20 more, but, but for example, all of these different cloud providers uh, that have released uh, the capability to deploy their software in any environment and build stacks and open clouds on them. So OpenStack.org is a good, good example. It was basically NASA and uh, Rackspace getting together. They're open sourcing their code and making it available to deploy uh, you know, a, a, cloud, a, cl a cloud operating system and a cloud stack uh, across anybody's um, infrastructure. You've got you know, Cloud.com, Citrix Zen Cloud, a whole bunch of these uh, available stacks. They'll ultimately consolidate, but what's interesting here is these stacks and how they function and how you interoperate and secure is pretty important. So as we're going to kind of go, go, go from the bottom of the stack up, if we look at the, the underlying functions that make up infrastructure, we look at the compute uh, cores and memory uh, elements, you've got compute fabrics now that um, could be commodity, they could be kind of massaged or engineered solutions, or they could be completely proprietary and specialized. L uh, you have kind of a battle raging between lots of CPUs versus um, fewer CPUs with lots of cores. So that's kind of an interesting thing that's occurring today. Uh, CPU versus GPU. So now you have the fir uh, well, one of the first uh, GPU clouds uh, being uh, powered by NVIDIA that was, uh, I think, released a couple of days ago for doing uh, huge amounts of 3D rendering. Right? Very interesting. So it's not just CPUs anymore. Uh, we've seen also GPUs being used in password cracking and recovery and those sorts of things, and also by botnets. Uh, lo the whole goal here is really about lower power, lower BTU output from temperature, and being highly dense. Uh, we've got interesting battles and discussions raging between vendors who support this stuff, between dedicated versus huge amounts of shared memory and allowing the uh, hypervisors to manage its allocation. Uh, and again, everything is really here in the compute layer talked about as being managed by these RESTful HTTP APIs. 
So you have things like that last stack, which was, uh, which was Google's, a bunch of stuff strapped onto a cardboard or plastic board you know, with even a battery backup. You've got stuff like Cisco's UCS. You've got stuff like uh, HP's Matrix. Uh, you've got things like uh, the Telera, 512 cores on a single CPU. You have uh, things like uh, this uh, C, oh man, I forget the name of the company, Five, but 512 Atom, Atom processors in a, in a half a rack, right? huge amounts of compute capability being squeezed into really, really small amounts of space. If we kind of go up the stack, though, and we think about all this compute node and how it's interconnected, uh, James Hamilton, who works at, uh, at Amazon Web Services, uh, as part of a larger presentation, wrote this uh, interesting deck that basically said, data center networks are in my way. Like, what I, what I need today from a, from a network capability uh, in the traditional uh, data center design is really, really stopping me from being successful in, in, in deploying cloud. So he talks about a whole bunch of stuff, like I spend a lot of money, it, it emits a bunch of heat, I don't have the density I need, uh, I, you know, where and how I can place workloads is actually restricted, it's a mainframe business model. I think all valid points when mapped against the business model of a public cloud provider and what they do. So when you think of, let's say, a Google or an Amazon or a Facebook uh, or even a Twitter, and you think about what they do from a load perspective and how they function and how their software is architected, what's interesting is the network architecture is very critical here, or will be and continue to be as it moves along. So these are some really, really dense slides. I'm going to kind of highlight them. But really, you have to figure out, first of all, where is the network? Is it in hardware? Is it in software? Is it, a, is it a hybrid model of both? In many cases now, we have software modules, Open vSwitch, Cisco's Nexus 1000V, OpenFlow, Nasira, that really talks about these uh, very interesting software-driven models of networking. You have to look at the fact that hugely abstracted networks really create challenges with things like network topology. Simple issues that we've dealt with before, layer two and layer three, but things now that, that, that have impact on things like support for multicast and broadcast, spanning tree protocol, um, our understanding of how networks function. Uh, security, how do I provide hooks to allow me to plumb in physical, virtual, or a combination of security capabilities to get me back visibility and management? Uh, the the uh, issue of mobility and the fact that as workloads move around, all of the network properties and policies and things that need to essentially be as asserted by the network need to follow them. Uh, and the network, network needs to be able to enforce them. So naming, location, addressing, and this isn't just in the local concept, this is a much broader global concept. As these clouds get millions of cores and they're in data centers across the entire globe, you have to figure out how your workloads and where your workloads are and how you're gonna basically make them available. Uh, this notion of performance is huge. Issues with I.O. in public clouds based on that abstraction is still a huge issue. Uh, playing packet ping pong with, pa with, uh, with traffic to move it in and out of virtual machines and virtual switches to actually al allow and enable it to be uh, inspected or enforced is a huge issue. And this really brings back the issue for most people of control when they think about how they're going to interact with legacy data or even private cloud to public cloud interaction is the, the revenge of the, the, uh, the meshed overlay VPN. Essentially what you see now is this really, really high level need for a bunch of the return uh, of PKI to manage uh, certificates and point to multipoint and multipoint to multipoint VPNs such that you can essentially connect resources in public cloud to those in private cloud and or, or uh, business partners securely. You know, what that brings up is the need for both physical and logical link encryption end to end, uh, authentication, tagging, and understanding that once all that stuff is encrypted, the network provider itself can't see what, w what's in that traffic, which is both good and bad. So if we follow this along a little bit more, what this gets into is the argument between kind of big, dumb, flat layer two networks on one end of the extreme of the spectrum, and the need for uh, kind of taking that next step set of evolution for the classical core distribution access aggregation layer sets of, uh, of, uh, com of networking. And so what that means is, you know, what in many cases these large public cloud providers want are heavily virtualized, incredibly highly dense, very, very low latency, non-blocking line rate, 10 plus gig uh, connectivity. So we're just getting to 10 gig, most of us in the enterprise. These guys are looking at 40, 100 gig pipes with multi-terabit switching fabrics. They control most of that stuff in software, right? With a network, they want these big, gigantic, flat VLANs. Well, these, I'm sorry, big, gigantic, flat LANs, not even VLANs. I don't know about you, but I remember when we used to have giant, big, flat lands and the problems both from a security and performance uh, perspective that that brought. So that introduces some interesting challenges, uh, not the least of which is this notion of full bisection bandwidth uh, versus massively oversubscribed ports. And what that means is essentially that every port has the ability to transmit at line rate without jumping or stepping on another, which is very, very important in high-performing compute environments because latency kills when you're moving huge chunks of data, petabytes. So what these guys look for are these gigantic switching fabrics, right? Um, 
But that introduces issues for an enterprise or even another cloud provider who may not need that amount of, uh, of connectivity uh, at, at latency issues that are an issue when they want to introduce things like segmentation. How do I deal with multi-tenancy and scale? How do I deal with things like um, when a lot of that networking is abstracted into the hypervisor? Do I use private or, or do I use VLANs, private VLANs?